Hello and welcome. I'm Todd Pringle, and this is the Crosswinds Institute podcast. Our guest is Dr. Ian McGilchrist, literary scholar, psychiatrist, and neuroscientist. Ian's paradigm-shifting thesis, outlined in his book, The Master and His Emissary, talks about how the differences in our brain hemispheres actually drive the evolution of our culture. It's required reading, in my opinion, for trying to understand the challenges that we face in Western civilization today. Joining me as guest host is Dr. Michael Robinson, professor of psychology at North Dakota State University and author of over 300 peer review articles in many subdomains of psychology. We actually shared the video we did with Dr. McGilchrist with an ethics class of future engineering students at North Dakota State University. And Ian was gracious enough to do a live Q&A with the students that we recorded. Ian is a remarkable man, a gentle soul with a formidable mind. Michael and I begin our conversation by sharing our perspective on his book, The Master and His Emissary. Well, the, one thing about the book is just the, the scope of it is something I wasn't prepared for, right? Uh, uh, so I was talking to this uh, laterality person named Christman, um, and he, he I, well, both of us were just noting about how there's a switch from the first half where where it's just an excellent um, analysis of the two hemispheres and then the switch to the culture and the history and uh, and the modern times right it's just the the scope of the work is is quite is quite nice but for me I think that the central thing was always the distinction that you kept making between, uh, phenomena and experience versus the representation of it, right? Mm, um, yeah. And that's something I think that quite resonates with, I guess, my research, more or less. Mm. Mm. So, for, from my perspective, um, you know, it, it's it's an honor to actually talk to an author of a book that changed the way you, you see the world. Um, I'm, I'm mostly from uh, the, the technology world. Um, my undergrad is in engineering, and I, I work around you know highly systematizing people and tend to think that way. Um, uh, yes. And the master in his emissary was the first. Really, th it, it unlocked this notion of implicit and, and and really understanding it at the nuance that that uh, you speak of changed um, mm. my whole perspective mm. about. What's knowable, you know, the, along with you know, understanding bounded rationality, understanding embodiment and and, and prediction, just understanding the limits of our of our ape brain, uh, and that we can't we can't find all of our solutions through explication. Uh, you know, it, the an, an analytical approach is not gonna is not gonna get us all the way there. And, and I, I mean, I knew that, but what your your thesis did is actually, I, I kind of I don't know, ironically, gave me a a detailed mechanistic framing for why you can't use a mechanistic framing to actually get behind the veil. Uh, and yes, I, I think that's fine. It's a sort of Gerdelian. Um, I'm demonstrating by the regular pathways that people are familiar with of science and, and reason, that science and reason can only take us so far. They're very important, but they just can't do everything. So maybe we start uh, by talking about the history of a little bit of you briefly, like how it is that you came to choose this path. I know it was a, a unique path. Uh, if you could spend a few minutes just um, building up a narrative uh, before we can get into the, the, the meat of your thesis, that would be great. Yeah, a couple of things that you mentioned um, sort of struck me. One was um, drawing attention to this, uh, which doesn't happen that often, actually, in talking about the master and his embassy to the fact that it's like in two quite distinct parts. And uh, indeed, I said to Yale, why don't we publish this as two books? Um, you know, one is about neuroscience and philosophy. The other one is about the history of Western culture and civilization. And um, my editor very wisely said, no, I don't think we should do that, because if we did, um, we, we'd, we'd find that the arts people would read one book and the science people 
people would read the other and there'd be no mm -hmm. <laughs> there'd be no yeah. bridge here between them and what's interesting is that i suppose unlike most people i'm not starting from science and then thinking how can i relate this to the world around me I started the other way around from the world around me. I had a deep grounding in the humanities, in philosophy and literature and languages and so on. And then I came from that into medicine, cold in my late twenties, and then went from there into research. So the only person I know, uh, <laughs> coincidentally, who had a similar path was Roger Sperry. Mm. And he too was utterly fascinated by this you know, bipartite brain. Now, I mean, the first thing I have to say to everybody, and God, it can't be said often enough, there's a lot of, you know, know-it-alls out there who just go, oh, you know, the hemispheres, uh, all that's rubbish, it's all that exploded a long time ago, but hang on, hang on. What was, the, what was discovered not to be fully correct was the way in which we formulated the difference between the hemispheres. And just because we got the answers to the question what are the differences wrong doesn't mean that there might not be a right answer because you know you've got to figure out why is the brain divided at all it's a good question because it you know people conceive of it as simply making connections that's where in its power lies then why is it asymmetrical and all the neural networks that we've looked at going back 700 million years are asymmetrical and why is the connection between these two hemispheres largely about inhibition and th this completely fascinated me because my interest in in medicine and i you know then trained to be a, a, a psychiatrist interested in the overlap between brain and mind um is philosophy and these are important philosoph philosophical questions mm -hmm. so for readers uh, well for for our viewers and uh, and when we take this uh we're going to have this at a uh, an actual classroom as well and then we're going to we're going to put it online and then we we'll have a uh the intent is to have an audience when we present it to the classroom as well um online but for those uh, people unfamiliar with with your work and uh, you know i guess i'll lay the groundwork to say who if, if people have read anything about hemispheric dis difference differences if they're if they're my age or older, they've probably been through the period of time in which, when there was a lot of pop psychology associated with it, um, mm. people should just jettison all of that mm. and, uh, to some extent and start. They from, should start from scratch. Um, and and if, if if you could talk about like yeah. how are there the fundamental ways of attending, you know, bringing it back to mm. Um, mm. You know, uh, thing, even even with birds, um, and then uh, yeah, yeah. sort of lay okay. the foundation yeah. for for being able to talk about how that then has affected both our history yeah. and our current civilization. Yes, yes. Well, I usually do say to people, if you think you know anything about hemisphere differences, but you haven't read my work, forget it. I mean, it sounds arrogant, but actually nobody I know has spent <laughs> so much of their life on this particular topic and read so widely in it and tried to make sense of it. And the story I tell is very different from the one that people think they know, that the left is somehow scientific and logical, maybe a little bit boring, but at least reliable and down to earth. Whereas the right hemisphere is somehow airy fairy, a bit, you know, artistic and given to emotional outbursts. This is so ridiculous. Um, that I can't, I mean, if, <laughs> I just forget it. It's, it just has nothing to do with it. The left hemisphere is just as emotional as the right, but more intemperately. So it's more dismissive. It's more expressive of anger. In fact, the most lateralized of all emotions is in anger and it lateralizes to the left. It specializes mm -hmm. in things like distaste, disgust. Um, so no, and it's not in touch with reality. I'm not the only person who said this, but the left hemisphere on its own is frankly deluded it can't be relied on on its own it it reaches bizarre conclusions and indeed the illnesses that um we think of as marked by delusions particularly schizophrenia are very like a situation in which the right hemisphere is failing and the left hemisphere is in overdrive trying to make sense of something it can't really understand hmm. so let's have a look at this The short answer is <laughs> that 
for evolutionary reasons, all creatures have had to solve a certain problem, which is how to focus on food and catch it quickly, deftly, skillfully, and yet not become somebody else's meal. And that means having two kinds of attention to the world at the same time. So one is already spoken for. It's, it's, it knows something, it sees something, it knows it wants, and it goes for it, it's familiar, it, it locks onto it, it freezes it, it brings it into sharp focus, and it grabs it and gets it. And that kind of attention is particulate. It is really very, very narrow beam. It's probably not more than about three degrees if you look at it visually out of the 360 degrees. So it is very, very particulate. And it's intense and it's very sharp. However, the right hemisphere is holding together the whole world at the same time with a quite different, uncommitted attention for what it may find. It's broad, it's open, it's sustained, it's vigilant. And this is what keeps us alive. And if you want a sound bite, basically the left hemisphere helps us manipulate the world, get stuff, use it. And the right hemisphere helps us to understand it. And these are very, very different things. Now, there's nothing actually particularly original about the parts of this. What's original is putting them together. And this seems to get up the noses of some scientists. <laughs> so no, no, nobody who knows anything about the neuroscience of attention and no neurologist who's had patients with right hemisphere strokes or, or, or left hemisphere strokes or injuries will dispute the fact that there are these differences in attention. That is completely conventional. The other thing that's completely conventional comes from a different world, that of philosophy. If you attend to something with a different kind of attention, you see something different there. And, you know, psychologists and philosophers see that very, very clearly. So if you put those two things together, if the two hemispheres are attending, as they definitely are, in two quite different ways to the world, they will necessarily, logically, inevitably bring into being for us two different kinds of a world with two different kinds of phenomenology. And what is that like? Well, in that of the left hemisphere, everything is familiar. It's what you want and you know and you've already targeted. It's also isolated, atomistic, separate from everything else. It's decontextualized. It's disembodied. It's categorized. It's somehow inanimate, effectively. It's very simple, explicit, and a representation of something, but it doesn't really want to go into all the experience of that particular thing. So it's really just gone a token. It's a bird. It's a seed. It's my prey. It's what I'm going for. Meanwhile, the right hemisphere is seeing precisely the opposite of this. It's seeing a world in which nothing is ever finally completely separate from everything else, a world in which nothing is ever fixed and unchanging, but constantly flowing, in which the important stuff is often implicit, not what is explicit. Um, it's the, the stuff that poetry deals with, the music, myth, narrative, tell us about, it's the stuff that is not said, it's the way things are said, it's our body language, it's our facial expression, it's our tone of voice, it's our irony, all these things that make it what it is. And this world is effectively animate. And I, I mean this in a very simple way. You can, using TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you can suppress at one at a time each hemisphere. And if you suppress the right hemisphere, you find that people look at things that they would normally think of as alive, a person or an animal, as more like a machine or a zombie or something mm -hmm. that has no life. But if you do the opposite and suppress the left hemisphere, they will say that the sun in the sky is alive, it's moving, it's giving life. So these are very different ways of thinking about the world, and they have quite different qualities. Um, I, I had been puzzling in my previous life in which I'd really been writing about the philosophy of art, why it is that when we analyze a work of art, whatever it might be, but in my case, I was mainly thinking of poems, you take what is necessarily implicit, because that's where the power is, and make it explicit, and then it has no power anymore. It's like explaining a joke. If you take Hardy's wonderful poems that he wrote, 
in the death of after the death of his wife in 1912 to 13. What is he saying? Well, what he's saying boils down to it's very painful when you lose somebody you've loved. But if that was the case, <laughs> it, nobody bothered to read the poem. Yes, I mean, it's ridiculous. So, yes. so it, 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 it's making the implicit explicit. It's also making the unique. You know, the poem is really unique. If you hadn't read it, there's nothing else that will substitute for it. It's making it entirely general. And it's also abstracting what is necessarily embodied in our physical being, which includes also our emotions and our, uh, our, our moral being, and taking it out of that and turning it into a lot of very thin cognitive propositions. And uh, this seemed to me a very odd thing to do because it's working in the opposite direction from the work of art. And it was only later when I discovered that the right hemisphere is the one that understands the implicit, understands the unique case, and sees things as essentially embodied, whereas the left hemisphere tends to abstract them, generalize them, and make them explicit, that I realized how difficult it had been writing my first book, which was called Against Criticism, about what we got wrong when we approached a work of art. Because, of course, the left hemisphere is the one that does all the speaking. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I was having to try and put into language the left hemisphere could articulate some very deep truth. And I've gone on trying to do that in my work. So people say to me, well, you know, your work is very left hemisphere. It's enormously scientifically based. It, you know, I'm, my latest book, The Matter With Things, refers to 5,500 articles, um, pieces of research in, in the science literature. And, you know, I argue towards my conclusions in a very reasonable and rational way. But there's nothing wrong with this. It's just that my whole purpose is to show that at the end of things, there is a bit of us that can't be captured in language, can't be constrained simply by reason, although it's not irrational, it's just beyond reason, that can see other things that are profoundly important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so to sort of paraphrase, uh, if the, the right hemisphere is taking in the world, it's seeing a whole, it's seeing a gestalt. Um, it's, it's, its understanding is essentially implicit. It definitely knows things, it, it, to the extent that that's an appropriate uh, um, uh, use of a phrase right now, but it, it is a source of consciousness or wherever consciousness comes from can definitely attend via the right hemisphere and take in the whole. But to, yeah. to know anything past that, to, 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 to break it up into parts, to put some sort of overlay on top of it that can be explicit um, is, a, is the left hemisphere's role. And when we're attending to the world with the left hemisphere, we're doing it essentially through the world that the right hemisphere is presenting, uh, but inevitably the left hemisphere's version, which we experience consciously, which the things we know via our left hemisphere is inevitably a reduction, it's inevitably a data compression, it's, it's inevitably involving a whole lot of ignoring because you can't see anything without ignoring everything else. And to do that, you have to have a value frame by which you choose to attend to something. The, the, the left hemisphere is essentially getting this big gestalt uh, it has goals, you know, it has associations, it has, it has its own learned patterns, uh, and it is seeing within that gestalt, the, 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 that's a cat, that's a house, that's a whatever, various labeled objects, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the explicit framing. Um, and, and you talk in the book how when things are working right, the, the, it, it, the right hemisphere is taking in the whole, the left hemisphere is doing a kind of deconstruction to find the, the, the relevant things for us to take action in the world. Um, and then there's a sort of merging back to the right when things are when things are in balance. Can you can you talk a little bit about um, mm. what you mean? Because I, I both Michael and I have really mm. sort of I, we understand that at some level there's at the end of the day it's still its own metaphor, uh, but this notion of of the right the right takes it in the left sort of deconstructs it and when things work well the it gives it back to the right and now you have a reintegrated whole but that we've sort of um, lost the script uh, uh, and, and the left is now believing it, it, it does know the world. C can you add a little bit more detail of that, that mm, uh, what you yeah. know, how that looping works? Yes, yes. What the left hemisphere does is very necessary. So it is a very important, helpful servant. It's just that because of its lack of knowledge and understanding, it should never be the one that calls the shots. So there is a, an inequality in this asymmetrical relationship. And you, there's different ways from ordinary life you can think about this. One helpful one, I think, 
is the well-known one of the map and the terrain. The map is for use. Um, it, it's not supposed to be um, a, a, an alternative to the real world. It's just a way we can use a kind of abstraction to help us navigate. It has almost nothing of the reality, the complex reality of the world that it maps in it. But that's not a failing, that is its strength. But we don't live in the map, we use the map to get around and we put the map away and we live. Similarly, you might think of, um, if you're a musician, of approaching a piece of music you want to learn to play. You're attracted to it as a whole to begin with. You try to play it and then you realize you have to break it up into parts. You have to practice certain sequences to get the fingering right or whatever it may be. And you can also take it apart schematically, theoretically, and see that at this point there's a return to the dominant or whatever it may be. Now, all this is very, very useful. But when you go on stage to perform it, finally, none of that is available at all. It's all been subsumed into a new enriched whole. And you go on, you, if you think about all that, you'll give a terrible performance. So you, as it were, forget it, but it hasn't been lost. And, uh, you know, and a, another third possible way of thinking of this is I, I resist the temptation to think of the brain as a computer because it's just not like a computer in a whole host of ways that I can talk about if you want. But in some ways, the left hemisphere is like a very efficient computer. The right hemisphere needs to see the whole, mm -hmm. but it also needs to be doing some kind of principles, uh, working out some principles, working out some theoretical things, basically following certain procedures, almost of an administrative kind. So it needs a high functioning functionary or a computer that will compress the data, do the data and cough something out again. The computer doesn't understand what it's just coughed out. It's the person person who put the data in, who takes up what the computers produce, and with their complete understanding, or their greater understanding, let me put it that way, of the whole, take that back into what is now an enriched vision. So that's the way the two work well. The trouble is that, as um, those of you who know the psychological literature will, will know, or perhaps have just observed people in your life, the people who know least think they know most, and people who know the most realize how little they know. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the left hemisphere, knowing only a tiny fraction of what the right hemisphere knows, thinks it knows everything. So I watched Star Wars when I was a kid and was filled with awe and wonder. Uh, and then when I got a little bit older, I watched Joseph Campbell being interviewed by Bill Moyers and he deconstructed Star Wars and told me that, that that's the standard hero's journey, the chosen one, um, the, you know, the rescue your father and, and, and that whole bit. Um, and that, that I could never see Star Wars again with the same level of awe and wonder because I always would see it by that, by that framing. Um, and okay. so I'm still trying to get back to the, to the, to the reintegrated whole. <laughs> Uh, George Lucas's okay. dialogue and okay. other things make that a little bit more challenging. But I mean, a good poem um, does it really mm. need to be deconstructed? I mean, is it, if its message is implicit, you know, sometimes mm. it's better to just mm. um, experience it. But um, Michael, what questions do you have? Oh well, uh, well I perhaps think... I could just perhaps I could yeah. just comment on that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, because I spent a lot of time actually doing exactly that, talking about literature with students and writing about it. But, you know, the, the end point of what you said is this kind of paradox <laughs> that you end up being able to say nothing about literature. But in fact, by a kind of self-aware undermining of the process, you can reach the point where you can say things. So I published a book called Against Criticism, my essay, and in some ways that was an exposition of why a lot that we do is destructive. But in some of it, it was criticism working against itself. So I was using criticism to show how we could actually see that three great people who have obvious kind of imperfections if viewed in an entirely theoretical way. I chose one very great essayist, Samuel Johnson, one very great novelist, Lawrence Stern, and one very great poet, William Wordsworth. They have 
obvious kind of weaknesses or imperfections or oddities, if you like. But what we can't see by this analysis is that actually what we're talking about as weaknesses are the very strengths that make us love these people and think that they're telling us something really important. So I was using criticism to undermine itself and in the process producing a critique, I hope, which opened people's eyes. Because I believe the point of criticism is not to get between the reader or, or, or whatever and the object, but to get out of the way and help by unveiling it, help by clearing away misconceptions so that the, the reader can see the thing for the first time without that clutter of intervening um, clever ideas. Mm -hmm. But but that's oh no! But that's not the way criticism is typically used, right? It, it typically is uh, to destroy, essentially, right? To destroy the the thing. Well, there are two things that I notice. One is that people people critics often write as though they kind of somehow are superior to the author they're criticizing. That the author couldn't see certain things. That because they're so much cleverer, they can see. Yeah. That seemed to me to, to be a, a bit of a, a problem. And the other was. That um, they use it to show off. You know, you've got in, between you and the work of art, you've got this trampoline with this guy doing acrobatics on it and showing off. And really, you just want to tell them to get the hell out yeah, of it I and allow you actually to, to get in touch with the work of art. Anyway, yes, enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, well, so we were talking about the the laterality aspects of your analysis and and how you, you came to an area that had a, a lot of dead ends or or. Uh, or they're just limited conceptions of what was going on with the two hemispheres. Uh, mm. and, and, then, and then somehow in the end, you're able to sort of reconstruct the whole, the whole area in such a way that it's, it's, it's pretty magical how that happens. Um, would, would you say that there are any ties to sort of some of the established frameworks? Uh, for example, you were arguing that, that the, the idea that the right hemisphere is emotional and the left is not emotional, that's not true uh, because the left does have certain emotions, right? Um, but but it, it, it occurs to me that some of the ways you talk suggests that some of the other maybe traditional ways of thinking about the hemispheres might have some merit to them. The, earlier when you were talking about the, the sort of the attention styles, it reminds me very much of this sort of global, local sort of way of characterizing attention, right? That, that one can either attend to little parts of things or, or to the whole gestalt, right? And uh, somehow that seems to be mapping onto the left-right pretty well, right? Yes. I mean, you're absolutely right. I sometimes put up a slide from the internet when I'm lecturing um, which the two columns, right and left, and it's taken off the internet from a fairly reputable psychologist site. And it was entitled in the original right and left, and I entitled it right and wrong. <laughs> because of, of these 20 differences, there is just one that is correct. All the others are wrong. And I asked people to get which one it is. And the one is actually this distinction between global and local. And that is the one thing that people had right. But all the other things, like, for example, the, the left is emotional, uh, sorry, non-emotional, and the right is emotional. It's not just important that both of them have emotions. It's important what kind of emotions. In other words, it's the how of their emotional life that is different. Uh, reason, both of them actually, not just the left hemisphere, both of them are important for reason, but it's the how that with which they approach it that is different. Language, it's always said that the left is the linguistic hemisphere, and there's some truth in that, but it's also true that a very, very important part of the understanding of language comes in the right hemisphere, and once again, it's the how of what they are contributing that matters. And the same is true of visuospatial things, so they each contribute visuospatial things, though that was said to be exclusively right hemisphere, and it is much more right hemisphere, but the left hemisphere can and contribute visual spatial um, awareness. It's just that they do them in quite different ways. And those different ways 
are part of the picture I have outlined already in a very crude way of these two takes on the world. For example, if you look at the emotional difference, it's quite interesting what kinds of emotions. So the left hemisphere is particularly associated with anger and disgust and rather superficial self-affirming social emotions. But the deeper ones of um, tenderness, um, sadness, uh, empathy are much better sub, uh, sub, um, sustained by, mm -hmm. by the right hemisphere. And the same with, with reasoning. There's a certain kind of almost computer-like mechanical reasoning the left hemisphere is very efficient at. But using reason in an intelligent way involves making certain kinds of deductions, which the right hemisphere is much better at making than the left. Mm -hmm. Equally, language, L language in the right hemisphere gives us all those things that make language <laughs> comprehensible. If you just have a dictionary with all the words and a, an English grammar and you put them in the computer, unless it has experience of life, it won't understand the first thing it's dealing with because so much of what is the meaning is the secondary implicit um, contextual stuff that the right hemisphere understands and so on. So they have their very different ways of being involved in everything. So I say that the old ideas, um, they had vestiges of truth at times, but they still focused on what the brain does because they kept thinking the brain's a machine. And the question you ask of a machine is, so what does it do? It photocopies, it toasts toast, whatever it is. But actually the brain is not a toaster or a photocopier. The brain is part of us and it has different ways of attending to the world which lead to different kinds of um, a disposition in life. So uh, there's a, there's something yeah. I sort of struggle with here um, in the territory for the map. But I, I I love that idea. So you've got the right hemisphere. Uh, so our ancestors are standing on a bluff. I don't know what they call a bluff in Scotland, um, but uh, probably hopefully a bluff with a with a Scottish accent. Um, but our ancestors are standing with a with a with a spear at a bluff, and they're looking down at a big long valley, and it's got hills in the distance, and they're looking many many miles, and there's lots of different. Uh, uh, features on the topology that they're that they're looking at, and the right hemisphere is taking in the whole, uh, but it's already learned associations. It's already got patterns, or it can't see anything, right? I mean, so it, it's able to 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 take in where it's at, uh, and and you can experience the consciousness of that. But once you have to disambiguate it into some sort of mapping, where you think that is a, I can see the the game trail going this way, and and there's the stream over there, and 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 certainly if you're using these terms too, right? Um, you've you've broken it into a kind of map uh, that whether you whether you're talking to somebody about it or you're just thinking about it, you're experiencing a kind of map no matter what. Just if you have dimensionally reduced this this scene into pieces that you can take action on, but the 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 part that at least as I've absorbed uh, three times through your book and then and, 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 a, and a bunch of other predictive coding and embodiment and lots of other literature trying to understand and, and, and to me like cognition is a is a is really built on uh, substrates for spatial navigation which are built on substrates around embodiment and and and, and all of space is essentially, Parts of it are, are actionable with our body and some of it are, you know, actionable in the sense with our senses that can reach out. And so if you're looking at mountains miles away, to, to me, you're still fundamentally taking action because you have to choose to attend to the mountains. You have to orient towards them. Your eyes are taking that in. You know, you're, you, you might not be able to move the mountains, um, but it seems to me it's still a spatial thing. And when we, when we get to abstraction... And we, and we think about the hemispheres and the right hemisphere taking in the world and the left hemisphere sort of deciding where, what to take action in that world. And we go all the way to language and we say stuff like, well, the left hemisphere is where language is, but the right hemisphere can, do, can do understand language too. And it's like, how, how does that work? Uh, and, and to me, and, and, and tell me if this is a proper reading of it, as we you know, have taken in the world and we've given things names that have salience to us and, and, and then we turn them into sounds and and we can vocalize them. And then we go and turn those into linear narratives, which are kind of like walking through space. And we share them with people. The words themselves 
become part of the world, right? When you, you, you got the territory, yes. you drew the map, now Correct. the map exists. Yes. So now the map is yes. actually part of the world, and the right hemisphere is then able to attend to that dimensionally reduced world. And, and then mm -hmm. the left hemisphere then decide to make the, the, the path uh, and, and, and plan the route through the map. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and instead of a, a toss, tossing back uh, um, once to the left and then back to the right and then we're good, I mean, it, it seems like it's more of a recursion. It, oh, of course it, it is, yes. All, mm -hmm. all the way up the yeah. frontal lobe go to more, extract, more mm -hmm. abstract things, which are like proxies for further distance because mm -hmm. it seems like the frontal mm -hmm. lobe it was more eventually evolved uh, for movement at distance. Just it seems like the concomitant sensory spaces when we when we went backwards are like more distance because you get the sensory motor cortex right here, which is like moving the body and sensing the body. But as we go back, it seems like those senses are picking up more distance and the frontal lobe is more action in a distance. It seems like that's the substrate that we've built all these abstractions on. And so if the right and the, and the left are bouncing stuff back, but when the but when the left is drawn the map and that becomes the world, the right attends to the map and we can go all the way to where we're having a, a, a conversation about language, but then the right hemisphere is living in that constructed world, correct? Is that uh, hopefully is that word salad or did that did that make some sense? <laughs> this this is this, by the way, this is you, this, you, this is this is classic Todd Pringle right there. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, okay. He, he uh, I was, yeah, I think I got some bits out of it. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, you're right that it's not just a kind of, obviously that's schematic itself, this right to left to right. Um, you can have as many recursions through this loop as you like. But what I'm really pointing out is that at the end of the day, it's up to the right hemisphere to understand the full picture of what's going on. It always is. Um, and the left hemisphere plays a part at a stage. It plays an intermediate part. It's a very good, speedy processor. As long as things are familiar, predictable, and follow the procedures it's good at. But faced with anything that is only partially known, uh, uh, may be extremely uncertain, may be completely novel. Um, the, the left hemisphere is at complete as a loss. So it's good for, you know, okay, we're on home ground here. Let's get the left hemisphere to do what it can do. It does its stuff and so on. The right hemisphere then can take up the, um, I mean, I thought there was a very interesting point you made, which is that, Strictly speaking, words are tokens. They're tokens for for what goes on in the real world. But they also, by being taken up into real life situations, a, a lot of the real world gets kind of rubbed off on them, if you like, so that a word is no longer just this cool token that stands in for something, but it begins actually to, to bring with it some of the experience, which is why certain emo emotions are immediately called forth when you even utter certain syllables and certain words, um, which is why poetry works. Um, poetry is taken language back into the real world. So I thought that was very nice. Um, and, and it explains quite a lot of the way in which they work together when they're at their best. Yeah, I, I just like the the idea of that this is a recursion and because you, you get lost in the word, right? And you think about a word and if it's just a left hemispheric token, if it's just if it's if it's well, just. So what would encourage the, the the transfer back and forth? Is it is it is it the the two hemispheres having a certain appreciation for each other or a, a realization that they need each other or there's limits to what they can do? Like, what would encourage sort of a, a more equal collaborative relationship <laughs> between the two well, well, let's, Yeah, one has to think about that on two different levels, because the answer to the question is there are things people can do, people can do, um, which might encourage this. But then before that, you were asking, you know, does the right hemisphere appreciate the left and the left appreciate the right? And the answer to that is that it's very difficult to say because in a way appreciating things is something that only a human being can do. However, you know, I do have this problem in writing about the hemispheres that people sometimes say, well, you talk about them as though they're like people. 
And, and this is difficult because there are two ways open to one to talk about them. One is as pure machines and the other is as parts of people. And the pure machine way is far more um, alienating and wrong. Um, it, it cuts out far, far too much compared with the fact that they are indeed parts of people. And then the, it's not just that when you have a split brain operation, you can see that there are these two personalities with two wills going on. You can do this by temporary, temporarily suppressing one hemisphere at a time. So, you know, we now know that they're ready to go. I mean, you don't have to have an injury and then wait a few weeks for this other part of the brain to decide, oh, I'm going to see the world differently. You can do it like that, and the two parts of the brain will see the world differently. So that is going on all the time in us. And at millisecond to millisecond intervals, we are synthesizing these two takes on the world because it wouldn't do for us to realize that there are two <laughs> there are two versions of the world being presented to us all the time they've got to be integrated or synthesized below the level of consciousness and this is what happens unless something happens like an injury or a split brain operation or something of that kind so in terms of what we can glean uh, you could put it this way, that the right hemisphere sees what the left hemisphere is able to understand, such as it is, but the left hemisphere doesn't seem to see what the right hemisphere understands. And this means that if necessary, the right hemisphere can step in and take over the local focus functioning that is normally that of the left hemisphere. But it can't work the other way. The left hemisphere, if required, can't take over the global functioning of the right. And equally, there's a detail from electroencephalography um, which shows that the left hemisphere communicates less with the right hemisphere than the right hemisphere does with the left. So it's like a sort of game in which you're tossing the ball between one another and the left hemisphere gets hold of it and plays with it and bounces it and chucks it up in the air and the right hemisphere is going, hang on, I need that ball back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, one question I have about the right hemisphere is you say that it, it's prone to sadness, which is interesting. And yet at the same time, its function is to be vigilant, right? To be vigilant concerning the state of the world. So mm. uh, it, you would think that maybe it would be prone to fear or anxiety or something, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm, but this, mm -hmm. the sadness connection is bringing in something new, I think. Uh, but besides, yes, it's really about besides, besides vigilance, right? It's bringing in... Yes, it is. Yes. I mean, you might well think that because of the role that the right hemisphere plays in vigilance, that it would be more associated with fear and anxiety than the left hemisphere. But there really isn't um, any strong evidence that either fear or anxiety particularly laterize either way. Each of them can give rise to them, each of them can sustain them. What seems to be the case, though, is that sadness often depends on forming a connection with something. Fear is about kind of like, I don't want this. Anxiety is about, I want to avoid this. But sadness is about loss, it's about connection, and it's about empathy. And empathy is something very, very special that is not peculiar to humans. Uh, the great apes also show it, and indeed animals such as dogs can show it and can even risk their lives to save other dogs or even creatures of another species, and it's not even just dogs either. So it, it's not an entirely human thing, but in humans it's taken much further because of the way in which we live socially and have been um, accustomed through evolution to do so, to cooperate. Um, and this bond, which is very powerful between the mother and the infant, and it is, you know, like it or not, it is the mother more than the father that forms this bond very early in, in life, which is part of the stability that that individual, that growing infant will have in its future interactions with human beings. This is based very much on the right ventromedial frontal cortex in the mother and the right 
ventromedial frontal cortex in the infant being in a kind of mutual relationship with one another. And it's this that causes the growth of fellow feeling of empathy, of understanding what's going on for another human being. And people but, who don't have such things like, like psychopaths appear to have very poorly developed areas in, in those regions. Oh, oh, uh, well, so it sounds like you're saying that the, the sort of global style of the right hemisphere, it, it, it partly is trying to mentalize other beings beyond the self, right? And that that, that in part is responsible for some of these social, uh, social sentiments that we have, like, like empathy. Yes, it's certainly part of what the, the right hemisphere for yes um so-called theory of mind which is a bad term because it's neither a theory nor is it just about mind but um <laughs> anyway theory of mind the ability to see that another creature may know something that you don't know um or that may not know something that you do know uh, which was in when i was training um in medicine was said to um begin at about four years old and is largely absent in people with autism and um, we now know that elements of this are, are present from much earlier in infancy and it is largely right hemisphere based yes although there are two kinds of theory of mind there's a kind of intellectual theory of mind and there's a more empathic theory of mind so, so right, the one yeah, that really yeah. enables you to put yourself in the other one's shoes that is more right hemisphere based the left hemisphere can get a kind of strategic understanding that aha he yeah, may not yeah. know what I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Right, and, but that, that that would be in the service of potentially manipulating the situation to your manipulating exactly. to your to your advantage. Mm. Um, and and the right hemisphere essentially cares cares about things beyond the self. Right. It, yeah. Is is capable of pro social sort of pro social sentiment yeah. or something like that yeah yeah is, is there also an element i mean because i keep thinking about the sadness and how the visual mm. the vigilance angle would be conducive to fear or anxiety but you say that mm. that that that's not really the kinds of emotions that the right hemisphere is prone to instead well, it's I, oh, I'm, just isn't evidence of that no yeah yeah mm. th that it ends up being prone to sadness and i think you talked about nostalgia as being another one that that mm -hmm. the right hemisphere is prone to uh, could this sadness connection also be uh s something almost like existential that 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 the right hemisphere is mm. aware of the the fleeting nature of time or the the sort of yes. its own incapabilities to to control everything in the in the environment mm. and, and that that would yes. lead to a certain a certain vulnerability that could be that could be felt as sadness potentially right mm, mm. well yes i mean that sense that you just completing of uh, reality is in eastern traditions associated with their very meaning and their beauty and so it's a very important sense and in my new book the matter of things um in part three which is metaphysics i have a whole chapter on time and different ways of conceiving it and why they matter to us and um, but i think the left hemisphere broadly speaking has a poor understanding of time altogether it sees time spatialized as if on a graph and it can see things to the left of where we are now and things to the right as it were but it doesn't understand the whole process of growing suffering and facing inevitable death and i think the right hemisphere does understand those things generally speaking the the emotional timbre of the two hemispheres is different it's one of the differences i didn't spell out but the left hemisphere is grossly over optimistic the right hemisphere is slightly too pessimistic it's closer to reality and mm. in fact there's some evidence that when people are slightly depressed they're more realistic than when they're not <laughs> but um but the left hemisphere is really um, flamboyantly out of touch. So yeah. if, if there's something wrong, it has n no, no, there's nothing wrong with me at all. Everything is fine. So much so that it will literally deny a gross paralysis on one side of the body. And if made to face the fact that a part of their body can't 
move. They, they just say, well, it's not part of me. It's yours, doctor, or it belongs to my mother, or it's that patient over there's hand, not mine. So it is really profoundly deluded, the left hemisphere on its own, whereas the right hemisphere is constantly bringing things back to, you know, um, a reality test. Uh, and, and so the left hemisphere being optimistic, uh, presumably that's in the service of, 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 of taking action, right? D doing something. Cause you, you know, if you have a yes. sense, if you, if you have a sense that if I do this thing, things will work out in my favor. Yes. Uh, and, and so the yes. left hemisphere is just right. right with this sort of unrealistic optimism. Um, that's exactly right. But it also goes hand in hand with something else that's very important if you want to act swiftly, which is uh, be cut and dried in your thinking and jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the jumping to conclusions is not the right hemisphere's forte, it's the left hemisphere's forte. And it wants everything cut and dried. What do you mean it could be this, it might be that, it's complicated. It doesn't yeah. want to know that because it's yeah. got to get it now. Yeah, yeah. let's do and it. It may be yeah. wrong, but it'll deal with that later. Yeah. yeah so right. the trouble is, that, that when you <laughs> when this left hemisphere mode of attention to the world becomes the the default mode of attention various things happen to the ways in which we interact with the world and in the second half of the master and his emissary as you know i suggest that there have been three times in the history of the west um when the two hemispheres have worked well together and these are roughly speaking the 6th century bc in athens around the year dot in rome and in europe in the renaissance 14th 15th 16th century mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in each case what happened was largely because the civilization overreached itself became too big and needed to have codification of everything uh, generalization categorization the rolling out of brute rules rather than the immediacy of taking in the individual case they turned more and more into unwieldy hierarchies of power and the left hemisphere triumphed and the the great thing is that although the left hemisphere's simple raison d'etre is power, power to manipulate, power just to do things, um, it in the end inevitably leads to the loss of that power because it doesn't understand what it's doing. And so it destroys um, the civilization that it could have contributed to if it had remained less arrogant, um, more willing to be guided by the bigger picture of the right hemisphere sees so does that does the so when this happens does the culture create a, a sort of counter force where okay we're we've we've tried the systemizing approach now we need to go back to uh, a more sort of naturalistic or spiritual uh, type of approach i mean do, do these does civilization sort of swing one way or the other and sort of end up in the middle at times Good question, and I, I, I suggest that there have been moments when there have been the occasional corrective swing, and, and I outline those, particularly in the modern history since the Middle Ages. Um, but I think that that relies on the capacity for negative feedback giving a correction. But there comes a point when the situation is so overbalanced one way towards the left hemisphere that nothing can now mm. uh, draw it back. It, it, it turns into a positive feedback loop rather than a useful negative feedback loop. And uh, some of the reasons for this are, I mean, some of the obvious ones are that because the left hemisphere mode is, con is so uh, related to grabbing, grasping and getting, that it is highly addictive and most of the the big um organizations in a world that is like this the bureaucracies the power hierarchies and now in our world very much big business it's so orientated towards greed towards more and more of something that has been good but the idea that more and more and more of it is going to be better which is almost never the case. Nothing you can tell me is so good that more and more and more of it at the exclusion of everything else is going to be good. 
And it's a kind of delusional situation, so it's very hard for people to see a way out of it. And just because it involves seeing less of the picture, it's harder to correct because it doesn't see what it is it needs to know. I mean, it thinks it's all fine. What's everybody going on about? Climate crisis? You know, um, what's going on in society with people just attacking one another? They weren't doing this 40 years ago. They're doing it now because we must be getting it all. You know, there can't be anything wrong with that. It must be that, that... what we're doing is is being misinterpreted by people because it's all fine. This is how they think, mm-hmm. and you see this in in whole rafts of people in in universities, in administrations, in government who think that what mm-hmm. they're doing and what they've been saying sounds so good in theory that it just must be right, and more right. and more and more of it is going to be better and better and better. Yeah. And they just don't think about what's being the neglected. Um, aspects that are, are simply very important. Uh, so, are, are, would you say that 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 we're more imbalanced right now than than has ever been the case? Is that is that essentially what you're saying? If that word was imbalanced, yes. Yeah. If it was imbalanced, no. No, no, no. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, uh, not non. Yeah, uh, run run away imbalanced. run away train. Yeah. Uh, we're out of we're out of kilter as never before. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I mean, I, I think the the value of your of your <laughs> the value of your work is it's hard to it's hard to quantify how important what I think um, your thesis is to where we are right now. Uh, uh, this this notion that we live in the world that we create, and if that world that we create remains predictive, we really think that's the world. I mean, it's the the predictive nature of a model that tells us whether we actually are lost or are where we think we are. And if, mm. so if, if you're a blacksmith, um, mm-hmm. there's a lot of implicitness to, you know, the way the, st- the way the iron moves. Uh, and, and, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of sort of a relational uh, uh, a view um, or an alchemical view, uh, sort of. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I work with engineers all the time. And, mm-hmm. and we have systemized... Mm-hmm. Um, almost everything, uh, uh, almost atomistically, uh, in this hierarchy of very predict of very predictive sp- uh, space. And when we're designing something, uh, the, the we know what an I beam is going to behave like because all the layers, all the ways up the supply chain, it's been systematized and predicted and quantified and and, and becomes something we no longer have to rely on anything implicit. And I'm using that example of like a blacksmith versus, versus yes. sort of modern modern yes. mill design. But 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 that's playing out at all levels of our society. It's playing out in our bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. It's it's playing out in what used to be our religious space, what used to be the sacred. Mm. We we've reached mm. a point. If I if I uh, your th- your thesis, uh, we've reached a point where, for now, uh, or maybe for a little while ago, because maybe it's unraveling now, or I, I think it is unraveling now. But we got so successful at so many different dimensions of what civilization is which the world we experience um and and so and, and we got so far away from where um the weather will tell you different um an impurity in the steel that you're hammering will tell you different or if you're an anim- doing animal husbandry you've got an implicit understanding of how these how your herd of goats will behave and somehow you can walk through the get them through the streets of delhi you can't explain why uh, because because you're, you're still operating at a, at a at a balanced level um, but it seems like our world right now, we have explained our way out of everything to the point where uh, we're secular and lost. Uh, we, we don't mm. know how to find meaning again. Um, mm. and, and it seems like for, the first thing we have to do when you're in a hole is stop digging. And the value of your yeah, thesis is, is is a framing of this is where we are. And it's actually related to mm. how our brains work. Um, but, you know, we did this, we did this to ourselves. So um, maybe we can get ourselves out of it. Is that a is that a, is that a fair interpretation? Yes, I think it is. Um, and in the no matter with things, my, my 2021 book, um, I do approach a lot of these big questions and suggest both what is wrong and how we might make things move in another direction. 
I just like to ask you a question. In these highly organized systems in which everything is predicted, do you ever find that things go wrong? Well, yeah, but it's funny um, because when something goes wrong, um, there's there's this mentality, you know, the you know root cause, find root cause, um, and it and it mm. and it's based on you know a kind of linearity. There's an awareness mm. that there's there's multi factors to things, multi causes, but like if. Mm. Mm. There's a product defect and it costs you millions of dollars. Mm. Um, the mentality is there was one thing that got out of control we thought was in control. Like all the other variation we've controlled, I, I, I find that's, root cause. Um, and that's you, very, yeah, that's very important. And I mean, I, I see um, things reported all around where people thought they'd got a watertight system. And they hadn't because there was something that they hadn't allowed for, which was atypical. And the thing is that we think that things will conform to a simple pattern. And that's the left hemisphere's idea. I can model it according to a machine and it will work according to a machine. The trouble is that most systems in life uh, and actually most systems in the cosmos, um, animate or inanimate, are complex systems, they're not complicated systems. And uh, what I mean, and I know you know what I mean by that difference, but um, a jet engine is a complicated system. It can be broken down into parts and those parts into further parts. There's just a lot of them which makes it complicated, but they're all linear. But complex systems are ones that are intrinsically non-computable. They contain re-entrant loops that will behave in ways that we cannot now predict. Um, even something as simple as a double pendulum defies proper um, uh, prediction. And, you know, the uncertainty principle that people think, uh, yeah, okay, at some sort of minute level, the quantum level, there's uncertainty. But in the world that we operate in, that's not applicable. Actually, that is highly applicable. And I sometimes quote a paper by two physicists, which is which I do refer to in, in, in the matter with things, who thought it would be useful to look at billiard balls. I mean, so an everyday level version of, you know, the idea of quantum uncertainty. Uh, and the ancient 18th century idea of how you could understand what happens next. The billiard ball collides A, collides with B, collides with C, collides with D, and it goes into the pocket. Done. Now, if you, if you actually do this at that macro level, you find that at a certain point, you cannot predict what the next um, billiard ball will do. And when I first heard this, I thought, well, okay, yeah, but how many would you need? 10 million or 10 billion, I don't know. But the answer is actually eight, you know, which is really, <laughs> I mean, that lives with me. I, at eight, we're already in, t in, in somewhere which cannot be entirely certain. And what is really important is that the left hemisphere thinks things are certain when they're not. The right hemisphere in, realizes that nothing is finally certain, and it's therefore far more flexible, far more alert to possibilities when they need to be taken. And in most intelligent situations, what we need is a system that allows skilled, experienced professionals to make a decision. If it's made by a machine, it will not be made as well. Um, it seemed like uh, one thing that you might be suggesting. So Todd, he's an engineer, right? He 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 works in engineering issues. It seems like what you're saying is that when you devote yourself to something like engineering, um, could, could that be sort of shaping sort of Todd's view of you know existence and and sort of his approach Who to are everything? We interviewing here? Well, no, no, I'm just thinking that. That to, to the extent for that, sure, I work with yeah, I work. Yeah. I'm an engineer. I work with engineers. If you, I mean, I yeah, and and I'm thinking about what's happening with uh, well. So, for example, um, uh, so I know of this university where a whole bunch of money was influx to support the engineering aspects of that university. Right, we're we going now. Uh, and so all of a sudden you just you're 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 just inculcating these left hemisphere people yeah. who are applying these hey. systems hey, we to made everything. The, we made the iPhone. Hey, we made all this tech that I'm barely that I'm that I'm barely getting to work. You know, with. and meanwhile we're not hiring the people in the humanities. So you, you, <laughs> the universities are 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 
are becoming uh, imbalanced. I, th- I think that's a relevant conversation. Um, it, the, mm-hmm. What is the value? If, if, if we've reached a point where we think that we everything is explainable. So, and even what you're talking about within like billiard balls, it's like if you bounce a ball, uh, um, like set, predict, deterministically predict its bounce. It's like by the seventh bounce, you have to factor in the 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 gravitational effect of a person standing in the hall or something like that. And and but there's still a mindset that that's because we don't have the precision in the measurement of the initial conditions. Mm. And a lot of the chaos stuff and yeah. the pendulum mm. stuff is we don't have right. the, the proper measurements. It's still this mentality that. We're ju- that that mm. our tech isn't there yet, and, and if you look at yeah. molecular yeah. dynamic simulations, you look at the modeling. Sure. It's, it's getting better and better. There's an there's an awareness yeah, when yeah. you reach a quantum level, you get uncertainty, but at the human mm. level, you get second order effects because when you're trying to predict mm. humans, it's an end end dimensional explosion. But you've got these agents inside the model that are mm. acting on what the model's predicting, uh, and and yeah. you're never going to get there from yeah. you know, <laughs> no, you, no, you, no. You, you have you have no, you know, weird no. but. This notion that the world is more complex than we can understand isn't. It's it's like we've it's, it's like we deny that. Yeah. We, 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 it's like we're not there right. yet. So we have these you know hyper rational atheists well, that and we just haven't figured yeah. out where the science it, 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 and fine it, consciousness. It, we're investing in disciplines that encourage us to think that way, right? And, and, and uh, we have well, the I, I occupation would, that there, encourages. I would argue that. that the 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 stuff that got us these things is not the stuff mm. that got us in trouble. Uh, I, I, I would say mm. that with, within humanities departments within with mm. critical theory uh, applied to mm. uh, the physical yeah. world is is the world of engineering yeah. gets mm. us stuff applying that same mindset um, to things that have implicit meaning deconstructing a poem as though you're an engineer yeah, yeah. It, it, to me yeah. is what got us there and so i blame that i blame the humanities and not the en- engineers just so <laughs> <laughs> so yes yeah well you're quite right Right to to say that the problem is not simply one of technology itself, um, although technology does encourage a way of thinking which is um, seductive but ultimately likely to lead us to be deceived. Um, so there's a lot in what you've both been raising about the balance between the humanities and the so-called STEM subjects and how important um, the humanities may be and what's happened to the humanities and the thing about engineering well let me just <laughs> let me just start with um with engineering so um i unfortunately um never got around to publishing a piece of research which i did when i was a senior registrar at the bethlehem uh, Royal and Maudsley Hospital in London, but um, and one day maybe I will. But in it, I looked at, it's a place that has gathered people who've come from often middle-class backgrounds because their parents were articulate and sought the very best treatment for them, and it's a renowned center of excellence. And so a lot of people who broke down in their, you know, universe years, which is when psychosis usually manifests itself, um, we've got records of them hundreds, thousands. And I went through these and looked at what degrees people were studying for when they got either an affective disorder, such as what's now called bipolar disorder, used to be called manic depressive disorder, or schizophrenia. Now, schizophrenia is very like, um, I can't say that this is exactly what is going on in the, 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 the right hemisphere brain, but at the phenomenological level, what it is like is somebody whose right hemisphere is simply not functioning and they're relying over much on the left. And the people who were doing, uh, who broke down while they were at university, the commonest degree was engineering for schizophrenia. And the second commonest was philosophy, which is interesting but it, quite explicable if you know the sort of stuff that goes on in many Western philosophy, so-called departments, which has little to do with the love of wisdom, which is what the word, word should mean, but instead is to do with um, a, a kind of um, mechanistic uh, manipulation of ideas according to a rather simple schematic way of thinking. And it's interesting that those two seem to turn out with the schizophrenia. People who were um, who got a bipolar disorder were studying history, were studying languages, were studying literature and so on. And some of them philosophy 
and some of the music. So anyway, there we are. Um, and it's of interest that Dan Dennett, who um, when asked is a, a, a human soul, said, of course there is. It's made out of lots of little robots, little tiny robots. And um, he himself, the famous atheist, um, said that if he hadn't become a philosopher, he'd have become an engineer. So make of that exactly what you like. I'm just reporting what he said. Now, in this, <laughs> in the situation about what's going on in our culture, I try to stave off two very simplistic ways of thinking about our relationship to reality. And I outline these, I think, um, clearly enough in the first 20 pages of The Matter With Things. And what I'm really saying is neither naive realism nor naive idealism is correct. So there are two equally destructive positions. One is that there's just stuff out there and we like photographic plates, we register it like data units, we sort it out and that's the relationship. It's stuff out there, something in here and, and we have no relationship with it really other than trying to get to know it. That is typical of a kind of old fashioned, unthoughtful science. And I think it's much less common now, never really worked for physicists, but well, certainly not in the last 120 years. Um, but there it is. The other one is the inverse of that, which is there is no reality. It's all stuff we made up. It's all postmodern. <laughs> this is what's going on in the humanities. We made it up and therefore my truth is as good as your truth. And then you get stuff like critical race theory and other stuff coming in. I won't even go there because it's a can of worms. But basically, once you've decided your theory is right, you don't see whether it actually measures up to the things you're looking at so that it helps you understand them more subtly. Instead, it takes them and tests them against the theory, the theory being completely unquestionable, and then scores them as like, this one hopelessly fails my theory test. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a, a bad way to be cheating works of art. It's a very destructive one and does the opposite of what a work of art should do, which is to challenge you and take you out of your preconceptions into learning something perhaps new. So there we are. Um, that's the kind of problem I think that we've got. Um, too much simplicity. Now, what I, what you, what you put in its place, what I say is that reality is something that is always coming into being and it's coming into being through encounters. And those encounters are inevitably relationships. An encounter is a two way relationship in which both parties come away from the encounter slightly changed. So in our encounter with whatever it is out there, we have subtle effects on what is there. It also has subtle effects on us. And since this process is going on 100 times a second all the time, it's a remarkably consistent um, process. And there are more and more people involved in this, of course, because everybody's doing this. And so reality is coming into being through our encounters with it. It is never a single stable system that can be completely isolated from the people that are attending, nor can the people who are attending be completely isolated from what it is they're attending to. But let me emphasize this. This does not mean and does not lead to the conclusion that it's all made up by us. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm saying absolutely not. But you, that it's essentially a, a relationship, as you say. So, so we it's would a relationship. We we would be involved in that, but with so, something external to us. Uh, a, yes. a thing, a yeah. thing, a phenomenon. Yes. I, but yes. Do you? So do you? Do you? Well, that's very interesting, right? The counterpart to the uh, to the too much engineers in the world is that the humanities have been doing some pretty pretty ridiculous stuff too, right? They have. So, they well, have. Yeah. They, they've, they've been physics envy. They did. I mean, it's yeah. like we have this science view of everything. Everything has to be explicit yeah. and explainable. And if it's not explainable, then we just don't understand it yet. And like right, right. Grind, grinding uh, down no, into it, com in, not complexity, but complication. Let's yeah, yeah. So complicated. Right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. No. floating frameworks it, it, that predict within uh, only interpret. Yeah. Well, it's, that you know, it's that, not an engineering problem. It's it's applying that mindset to to well, things yeah. that, where it doesn't belong. Anyway, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm in danger of ranting. 
Uh, so, well, no, no, this, but, you know, this is why this is yeah. why psycho psychology is so wonderful, right? Because it's it, it's uh, mm. it's highly scientific, but it's also dealing with experience, mm. experience and human beings. And uh, so yes. it, it, it sort of always has that. Uh, you can always go back to experience there. Um, and, yes. and yet you're you're applying these systems. So I, I was going to ask uh, uh, so maybe a couple of questions about about Eastern philosophy and mindfulness mm. and things like that. Mm. So mm. it seems these days that there is a lot of interest in in mindfulness practice, mindfulness thinking and some Buddhist philosophy. Um, are you encouraged? Mm. Are you encouraged by that? But by the fact that people are seeking some other ways of being that are maybe more actively passive, as you talk about? Yes, what I mean by actively passive is not just kind of being there and kind of shrugging your shoulders, but actually cultivating attention to things without going in and doing preemptively whatever it is you think you should do, or thinking preemptively whatever it normally comes to you. Instead of emptying your mind and being open for something new to happen, terribly important. And that is what mindfulness is, so I think it is a very useful practice. Um, but I think that what we need is, we need more, we need a number of things. First of all, there are three things I believe, if I had to cut to the chase, that ground human well-being and happiness. And these are not just my opinion, but in uh, both the master and his emissary, in which I look at the importance of social belonging um, for human happiness and fulfillment, and in the master and his emissary, where I look at the relationship between humans and the natural world and between humans and whatever it is we mean by the divine realm or the sacred realm. These three things, and I give masses of evidence because the, the literature is just full of it, that these are so important to us that they outweigh almost anything else we can do. They have effects on our moral well-being, on our cognitive well-being, on our emotional well-being, and on our physical well-being. So even the, the spiritual um, connection in those who are active in that respect, the effects are so strong that they are equivalent to giving up smoking, losing weight, and going to the gym three times a week. And that's not a reason for espousing them. That would be to, you, to turn them into utility, which is what the left hemisphere immediately yeah. wants to do with everything, because its only value is utility. Right. But we seem to have lost sight of other values that would fulfill us and are amply present in um, the relationships between ourselves and a, a stable social group that we can worship with, eat with, share our houses with, share our lives with, um, be altruistic towards, and our, natural, our relationships with the natural world and our relationships with the sacred. So these three things I think are very important. Now they would be fulfilled better if people had more of a sense of... Uh, in, uh, you, so you said uh, you said meaning mm. meaning is one of them, right? And, and I, I me, think, me, yeah. Well, meaning is one of the things that comes out of these things. Oh, oh. What are the so the three things are social connection. Uh, what were it, the other? It, it, well, the connection connection with with our social group, connection with nature, and the connection with. The sacred. Oh, now, okay. uh, those, are, those are big terms. And, uh, you know, we can talk endlessly about what exactly we mean, <laughs> mean by them. And I do write a lot about what we do mean by them. But they are the things that give meaning to life and make life feel fulfilling. And since we've systematically attacked all three of these in the last couple of hundred years, becoming more estranged from any understanding of what is meant by the sacred or the divine, being um, cheating the world as mere resource for fulfillment of what our left hemisphere wants to do with it, and cheating society as a collection of atomistic individuals that can be shoved into the machines of capitalism in whatever way, but without actually considering them as constituted by 
I mean, individuals are constituted by the society they come out of, and they in turn constitute that society. It's this two-way relationship I keep talking about. Look at that in relation to nature. Um, nature changes us. We know this from simple research that shows that just spending half an hour in nature, not looking at your phone, <laughs> but, but attending to what is there and being mindful, changes your blood pressure, changes your ability to think clearly, dissipates anger, and makes you um, feel better in, in a whole range of different ways. And, and, and I take it further. You see, look, you know, I was talking about how we change things by attending to them much as they change us. As nature changes us, we change nature by the way we attend to it. And the trouble is we've paid only the utilitarian attention to nature that means it is a heap of resource, as mm. Heidegger put it, that nature is just there for us to use. And this is a travesty of what nature is. It's a living, infinitely complex, infinitely beautiful network of, of things that we don't even partly understand, that we happen to be part of. And you know, relishing that and understanding that changes us and changes it. And I take this further still. So the third one, the one about the divine, I believe that we actually have a role in making whatever it is we mean by the sacred become what it is, much as it has a role in making us what we are. Now, that's a, that would be a bit of a long conversation, but I'm just saying it because it actually belongs with the other things there. Is that it? Is that in the 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 more recent book the, that are in the matter of things. Yes, okay. it is. Yes. There's a very long chapter towards the end that many of my philosopher friends begged me not to include because, because before they'd read it, um, because they said, Oh, don't touch the sacred. You've written a book that's really fascinating in its science and its philosophy, but nobody will take you seriously if you write about the sacred. But in any case, I just wanted to do so because it seems to me incredibly important. <laughs> it would be like building a an this a book. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and so a I, book. I, <laughs> I think I am. Go I'm going to read this. I'm it's gonna it's going to take me eleven pound book. Th this will take me a year and a half. <laughs> a year and a half to You're read. You're exag exaggerating slightly. I think it's eight point something. Okay. Pounds <laughs> <still>. <laughs> Talk the publisher into letting, if you're willing to do it. Uh, although it would be, it would be sort mm -hmm. of sort of self self punishment. If you could be the uh, narrator in the audible. Um, I mean, you, I've I, a lot I, of I, people. I, go ahead. A lot of people have asked me to do that, and I did try it actually, but because of a number of difficulties, um, I decided not to do it at the moment. But I might in the future. I mean, no, your writing is asking, accessible, though. It, at least it would, quite, would quite a, it would it would still be narratable by somebody else. But it's just amazing when the original author does it. Well, well, thank you. Yes, I mean, people have said about the master and his emissary, the, the person who did the audio book, although I think did a reasonable job, doesn't seem really to understand some of the things that he's reading, which is, of course, a disadvantage for the listener. But uh, so, um, I'd love in an ideal world to read it, but I also think it's probably quite hard to combine with anything else. I would say if you haven't got a hundred percent attention to it. Um, you know, the idea is maybe you can do it while playing golf or doing the dishes or so. I don't know, but <laughs> or going for a run or doing the gardening. I don't know, but I doubt that actually it can be taken in. in that well, I, I was wrong. with your other book. I was in restaurants and I was on my treadmill right. and I was all kinds of places. Okay, okay. But, yeah, right, do you okay. think he's talking about ways in which you would actually be able to record it? I, oh, oh, oh I, I see. I, mean, you're, you're going, <laughs> I think you're writing to be beautiful and accessible. And uh, Whereas... Um, Thank and, you. And I a, strive hard for that. Yeah. As I mentioned before, uh, before we were recording, you know, it's it's an honor to to be able to interview somebody who wrote something that, that fundamentally changed, changed your perspective on things. And um, you know, I, I would give very nice to him. I would give similar credit yeah. to, to to Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning, but that thing is mm. that thing is a that thing is a slog and a grind, and he knows it. At least he does the audible on that and makes makes it uh, more mm. accessible. Mm. But your your work mm. is uh, grounded in um, grounded in the. It's an interesting, very scientifically grounded. <laughs> 
you know, very, very mechanistic um, sort of lead into why um, you, you, why there's fundamental limits to this mechanistic view. Um, but it was just a deeply satisfying uh, book, and I would, and I don't, mm. I don't, I don't think anybody. Do, do you ever suggest people read matter? The, the matter with things without having first read Master and his emissaries? It is, is it a standalone? I wrote it so that it could be because the, um, not the historical part, the second half of the Master and his emissary, but the first part, um, I provide a kind of, you know, idiot's guide to what's been going on there in the introductory chapter. Um, so I wanted people to be able to start with the matter with things if they wanted. Though probably it's better to start with uh, the master and his emissary, but it's an awful lot to ask people to read two long books. Mm -hmm. And if they had to read one, the one I really want them to get to grips with is the matter with things because it's it's got so much in it. It goes so much further into philosophy, into what you know the nature of time, space, consciousness, matter, values, purpose, everything. It, it, it it's it's a it's, it's if you like an attempt to reorientate the human being in the cosmos and understand that we actually have a very important role here that we're not just these uh, pointless uh, mechanisms that um we're constantly told um, we are and i, I can't I'll, stress enough yeah, the second half of the I'll, book and the, the value of of nesting mm. your framework and in, and in, in, in revisit western civilization with with that in mind it, 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 mm. uh, it, he, he was talking about the this book yeah but they're, they're, yeah they're, oh. well, mm. I, I i take the matter with things to be everything you wanted to say in master and ms ms very a lot more and then getting deep deep into to sort yeah. of your your yeah. Yeah. what you want your legacy to be on um philo on philosophy yeah. and, and yeah the, i'm just so also on the science you know um i'm so tired of people who are you know frankly ignorant about the hemisphere theory because they haven't read what i've got to say and why would they because they've already decided that there's nothing in it they heard 20 years ago or 30 years ago oh that hemisphere stuff it's all been blown out of the water but it's really rather regrettable and a bit ignorant to go around dogmatically saying that all the time i want to say well open my books and have a look at the science there and tell me whether this is in some way something you'd like to discredit. Um, that will involve you in a bit of work, I know, but then you'd be in a better position to pass judgment. And I'm slightly tired of people saying, well, where's the evidence? Because I don't know, I can't think offhand of any scientific book that brings more evidence to bear on a theory than this one. Um, the two together, I I cite over six thousand, yeah. seven thousand. Yeah, and it's like did you, did you argue research. with the publisher yeah. about like size? Is like a size yeah. four yeah. font? Like the, uh, some of the uh, some of the well, bibliography. Uh, 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 I was lucky to get things the way I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So <laughs> we, we'd we'd like we, to uh, uh, transition to uh, one one more topic. Yeah. We, well, we'd like to at least yeah. to contextualize. Yeah today mm. uh, and and our technology the uh, the what's on our phones the 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 ai that's in our phones before we even called it ai ai was always this thing that that as soon as mm. we developed you know the ability to recognize an object or the ability to do speech synthesis we, we quit calling that ai and ai was always the future thing and something inverted mm. in 2023 where, where, mm. where chat gpt was enough of a wake-up call that we actually know mm. uh, from a pop uh, uh, from a pop culture, not pop culture, pop psych or whatever the view is, AI is actually here. But yeah, it's actually been here for 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 decades. And and I and mm. I wonder about mm. this whole if the when the left when the left hemisphere you know does a deconstruction and gives it back to the right, as long mm. as that's a predictive reality, you know, then then every mm. then the whole thinks that's what the world is, and we've mm. we've gone through centuries of. A pretty good technological, uh, you know, science-based secularism success at defining our world, and now we have uh, uh, an explosion. Sort of, we have a Gutenberg moment with, with uh, the information mm. revolution and the internet, and 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 possibly mm. even more so with with generative AI. And I'm and I'm mm. wondering how much thought you've given to have we taken the things that have, that have both been a, 
a boon and in the goddess wonderful technology but are, are also potentially our undoing have we accelerate have we just poured gas on it with mm. with uh the the ai that you've seen emerge in the past year yeah and then yeah. in context yeah. of like TikTok and youtube and the the algorithms that are mm. running basically at our attention you know training mm. <laughs> training us while they learn from us on how to manipulate our attention and and and, and these dopamine prisons we seem to have created do you see this as an accelerant mm. to to your critique of of, mm. of of what's happened in the modern world or is it more complex than that or is it a tangent well i think the short answer is i do see it as an accelerant i, I see it as rather like the left hemisphere on steroids uh, it, it is what happens if you make it uh, enormously um, extensive in its um, ability to do what the left hemisphere does which is uncritically to mop up um, data and uh, synthesize it um, uh, without really any understanding of what it's talking about and so some of the times it's it's okay but it also does what the left hemisphere does um, <laughs> all the time, which is if it finds there's a gap, it just makes stuff up and puts it in. So, I mean, this is a problem with chat GPT. It does it all the time. You, if you ask it to do your own CV or, you know, books you've written, it'll make up some stuff because it thinks, well, that fits. In other words, it's got, it's got a, a rigid um, gestalt, not the one that actually is real. It's prioritizing something it could invent, but not originally, only according to, not imaginatively invent, but just invent by going, well, if you've got A and B and D, you've probably got C as well, so let's just put it in. So I think it's extremely worrying. If people want to know a bit about what I thought about this, it was just before chat GPT uh, sort of happened. Um, I was invited to give, I think, the opening talk at the World Summit on AI in Amsterdam in November 2022. Um, I imagine they won't invite me back. Um, but I, I, was, so. I, watched, I watched it. That was a good talk. Uh, yeah, I was really emphasizing some of the problems that will inevitably arise. But also, coming back to what we were talking about earlier in relation to this, what the right hemisphere does is essentially, not just accidentally, but essentially non-computable. What the left hemisphere does is computable. It can be reduced to procedures. But the le what the right hemisphere is doing is simply not computable in that sense, because it can, it is really where the innovative aspects of imagination come from. And the trouble with AI is that if it wants to test something out, it will go and look at what it says in Wikipedia and all around the world, and it will come back with what people have already got there, which itself may have come from, Wiki from chat GPT. So eventually, whatever it is, chat GPT or its successors, no, will become externalized on the internet and then reflect it back to anyone who tries to find out truth. And so we'll be locked into a hall of mirrors. Now, this yep. is the precise problem that I draw attention to in both the matter with things and the master in his emissary. The left hemisphere cannot break out of these self-referring loops of what it thinks it knows and what it thinks it's created. And it's not interested in anything that conflicts with it or stands outside it, but that is the role of the right hemisphere to be able to do that it, it, and it without it like, we will like, we will be reduced to machines we will be reduced to zombies and i believe this is catastrophic i think it's deeply immoral um somebody i have enormous um sympathy and time for and think was a brilliant um philosopher um is uh Oh gosh, what's her name? Sorry, I've just completely lost her name. I, I quote her all the time. Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt. Um, and she basically said that evil is when people um, are reduced to machines and when they are somehow drained of their life. And this is what is happening through two procedures, I think. The old fashioned one is bureaucracy, which has suddenly burgeoned in the last 10 years and become overwhelming, partly through an unholy alliance with AI. 
um, and AI itself. They both express this lust for systematizing everything, making everything an example of a type or category rather than a unique case, um, completely ignoring all the subtleties, the layers of meaning, the differences that context makes, all this implicit understanding, all this, which is the really important stuff, is being driven out. And instead, we're, we're being offered something that will help us get things and get rich, but we will be impoverished spiritually to such an extent that none of this can possibly help us. In fact, it will only be part of how we hasten our own end. I mean, I've seen this as a psychiatrist. People who are extremely rich are among the most unhappy people uh, in the world. So what what do we do? So, I mean, how, if, if you were um, magic wanding a curriculum of a humanities department and you wanted to, um, I don't know if inoculate is the right term, but um, craft young minds so that they're thinking and attending mm. to the world in a way. The, wor the world itself isn't going away. Mm -hmm. the, the social media algorithms are still there. Um, I know, I know. Um, the, the, but I think... What, 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 do we, what do we do, at least at the, at the humanities level, well, we, the educational? Besides start well, with well, buying your book and books and reading them, for sure. Sure. Um, I mean, and, and in a less <laughs> frivolous sense, there is some truth in that, in that what yeah. I hope to do is explain to people what's wrong with what we're doing now. And I know as a psychiatrist, the first step on helping somebody change is not telling them what to do, but hel helping them see what they're doing now, which is not working. And then they see for themselves where they need to go next. So th there's that. But on the curriculum, it's once again not just the what, or even mainly the what, but the how that matters. So when I was at school, education, or at least the education I had, was very different in kind from what's going on, not just the curriculum, but the fact that what it was thought to be was not just the insertion of information that could then be regurgitated, and there were right and wrong answers, and you got you could be marked by a computer so many percent and you get a, you know, a certificate and now you're all set for a job that doesn't exist and a lifelong disappointment because you don't never really got an education. But that's what's happening now. And it's not what education is about. So it's about a spark coming from the teacher to you. And that won't happen if the curriculum is overdetermined. My teachers often chose to talk to me about things that they really understood and meant a lot to them and that fired them up, that they thought were beautiful, important, and true. And those things they conveyed to me. And really it was like a spark jumping the gap. So that something, you know, welled up in me. I want to know more about this. I really want to ask questions about this. And another thing about education is to know how to question things. I mean, the drivel that is believed by people nowadays is, I mean, if one hadn't seen it and heard it, I know that people that are probably not <laughs> without any intelligence are saying and believing this is extraordinary stuff. And it's because they've never known how to question anything. And I think that nobody should be able to get through school without having learned something I was taught, which is how to argue a position forcefully and then argue the opposite position forcefully. And you would be appreciated mainly on how you managed to argue the opposite position. If you were a success at that, then you really understood what you were dealing with and you're really learning something about how to think. So I think these, these are the things we're missing. I think that children should be taught um, about their history and not just a caricature version of it. In the last few days, I've heard something so terrible, so disgraceful, so utterly unbelievable that I can hardly even utter the words. But I'm told that in Sydney, a crowd of people were actually saying, gas the Jews? Now, Whatever you may think about what's going on in the Middle East, can those people really know anything about the history of the Holocaust? 
the most appalling act that humanity has ever seen. Can they really know that and utter those words? I'm not here taking sides about a dispute between Israel and Palestine. I'm just saying that does that, if they know the history, then shame, shame on them. It's utterly unbelievable. If they don't know the history, then shame on us for not teaching it to them. So I think we need to know our history and the history of our civilization and also some of other people's as well. But we should, not at the expense of understanding our own, we should understand literature, not just our own, but others as well. But we should primarily be able to understand our literature. We should be taught um, drama. We should take part in music. We should certainly learn how to enjoy and read poetry and how to understand it. And these things would give people some sort of excitement about their education. Whereas often what the STEM subjects offer is a technique in place of an education. If you follow these procedures, you will be able to do X. But that's really not an education. That's an instruction and a technique. But education is not instruction and technique. It's about something else. It's about causing a soul, a spirit, that of a person. Um, if you don't like the spiritual terminology, then their intellect, at least to flourish and to grow and to be nourished. So uh, I think these things are very important. And if we don't get them back into our lives, woe betide us. I think we, the children should also learn mindfulness in school. I think they should learn mediation. So they should, they should at least at one point in their education before they leave school, they should do some a psychology should come into school and teach them skills of mediation. Because again, it's about seeing other people's points of view, helping reconcile people and bring peace where there was discord. Instead, our, our culture is intent on causing discord and rivalry, um, simple black and white visions, um, contempt and anger is everything the left hemisphere stands for. Simple, simple views, black and white views, contempt for the other, and increasing conflict. And, you know, I can look back on my life. When I was growing up, I was born in 53, so I was a teenager in the 60s. We believed that there would be a decreasing gap between the rich and the poor in my lifetime. We believed that people were coming together, that things were going to be better between all the different groups that you might identify in society, because we could see it happening around us. and. I would say that in the last 30 or 40 years, this has gone badly wrong. It's gone in the other direction. All those things that were little by little moving in a good direction are now moving in a worse direction so that there is far more enmity, far more fear, far more resentment between groups, which is not good on any count. There is um, a widening gap between the rich and the poor. People's jobs are less fulfilling rather than more fulfilling than they used to be. Do you remember there was a time when AI was going to do all the boring stuff for us and people worried, what were we going to do with all this time? Well, I can tell you what we'd do with all this time. Spend the morning on the internet going round and round in MC Escher-like loops, trying to solve a practical problem that 10 or 15 years ago was solved by lifting the telephone and talking to somebody for five minutes but now because the IT is actually very poor and it seems that while we can create something that looks like a human being and talks a bit like a human being that's one kind of IT but contempt for the rest of us who spend our lives dealing with incredibly bad diminishing kinds of IT that take up our time and our time is our life so you know this is this is very very serious stuff in my view well, how do you start? Like, if it, I mean, have we have we have we carried criticism way too far? I mean, how how do we how do we teach Western civilization and come to a point where um, people understand what's what's beautiful, what's true, and what's good? I mean, I, I don't even know. Imagine those three words being being stated in in some humanities classes. Um, they would be kind of be um, kind of be laughed out or said, "What you know? What the hell are you talking about?" It, 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 how well, do we? That, 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 that's a sign of the mess we're in. Yeah.
Um, and no, I don't think we've been, we should be less critical. I think we should be more critical, but critical in a constructive way, in a civil way, in a thoughtful way. Um, and I'm not against the criticism of literature. For all that I wrote a book called Against Criticism, in it I managed to do a lot of literary criticism of the kind that I believe in. So, uh, no, what I, th what I think we need to do is a number of things. There are obviously practical steps in the left hemisphere way that we can take. We can, we can address, and we are addressing, but not fast enough, environmental destruction poisoning of the oceans and the felling of ancient forests, the destruction of, of lands that belong to indigenous people, the change in climate and so on. These things are very important. Having a new, uh, completely different attitude to education, these are things that can in part be legislated for. There again, the left hemisphere has its useful role as a kind of superior bureaucrat, as an emissary, as a functionary. But really what I've been saying all along and saying in both these books is that the important thing is in our hearts and minds. And that that's effectively where we are either blessed or condemned to live out our lives in our hearts and minds. And what we find there and what we see there and how we affect the world is to do with the kind of attention we pay and is, is also a consequence of how we see ourselves here. So if we see ourselves as here to, to have a good time by exploiting other people and the natural world and in the process um, helping to destroy our home, then fine, but you won't get happiness that way and you will just further the destruction um, that seems to be happening uh, all too fast already. If what we want is people who can find a different orientation and they need to find that in themselves. This is good news and bad news. The bad news is that it doesn't hit the headlines tomorrow. The good news is that it starts being real right now, today. So people can, immediately they hear this, they can begin to alter their own attention to the world, question how they're thinking about things. What has happened to the values of goodness, beauty and truth? and the sacred, the holy, these things which are more important in my view than anything else. Values determine the way in which we act and the way in which we, the direction in which we move. And in my lifetime, I've seen them all dismissed or travested. No work of art is now, no artist indeed is happy if his work or her work is called beautiful. They want it to be powerful. Power is the only value and it is the value of the left hemisphere. Uh, nobody is interested in truth anymore in politics. They're only interested in power. What will give power to a certain group or to a certain party? Um, and, and goodness has gone out of the window. It's been replaced by following certain codes and dogmas and so on. These three things that should be the shining lights that instruct us and lead us forward have gone. And so we need to bring them back into our lives. And it's never too late to do so. And you can start immediately. So I believe if you do this and begin to open yourself to the possibility of seeing those things everywhere, that you will begin to change yourself. And it'll happen faster than you think. And you'll begin to change the world. Do you know what the commonest message I get? I get a lot of messages from people. I love it. I can't reply to them all individually, but I'm very grateful to them. And what people say, two things are the commonest. The absolute commonest is, your book changed my life. And, and that is so wonderful to me. And, and they mean it almost like as soon as they read whatever it was, it changed the way they thought and they have never gone back because once you see what it is I'm talking about, you can't unsee it. That's what people say. And the other thing they say is that what you unveiled, what you revealed to me was something that at some level I was already aware of and I knew that it was real but was missing and I didn't know how to articulate it. I had no language. You have given me confidence and you've given me language to discuss it with. Now in that case, what I'm already doing in my own small way is midwifing something into being, but it can only be if people want the birth of something new. So it's, 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 it's a partnership again, it's a relationship between, between us all that will bring this about. It's not a theory, it's not a single action or even a number of actions. They're important in their way, but we have to 
refine that spark, that fire that is in us and nurture it. And we don't know what it is until we try nurturing it. It's no good sitting outside it and going, well, what are you talking about? I don't understand that. What's anyway this idea about the sacred? I mean, hell, what's that? I mean, explain to me. I can't explain it. It's like I can't, you can't sit on the bank of a river with a little manual telling you how to swim. You know, if you want to swim, you have to get into the water and then you may learn how to swim. All the things I'm talking about are of this kind. They can't just be done by a manual sitting outside it. You have to trust something and try. I, I, I would add myself strongly to that list of people who would tell you that, that, that your book, your, your thesis, your work has changed my life. I mean, I, as a well, hyper-rational, um, um, very, very mechanistic. I'm grateful for that. <laughs> um, I would be I'm an autistic all in all in di all but diagnosis. Um, to, no, you know, no. Ch chasing but may I also explanation for everything. Understanding that the implicit itself, that you can know something implicitly. Uh, that that trying to know it further, you you there's a loss. Sometimes it's useful because you can take action in yes. the world, but there's a loss in that in that reduction, and that and that, that the real is still there. You know whatever the real mm. is, uh, and and you're not going to get. You're not. You'll always asymptote towards truth if you. I mean, sometimes and it looks like you're asymptoting, yes. but you look at it from a different dimension, and you've actually veered far away from from it. Um, yeah. If you if you yeah. try to stay in the explicit world, but you can, you can get yourself closer yeah. to truth. You can certainly know beauty. Um, yeah, you can you can uh, know goodness. Yeah without having to have yeah. an explanation for it. And we're like locked yes. in this sense that it, nothing's real if we can't yeah. explain it. And, it, and, it, and it, yes. it's just playing out it's in so many ways in our society. Yeah. And your work, I hope, um, will be seen as as, as influential as, as Darwin's work in terms of giving us a, a, a new frame of reference to see mm. ourselves uh, and wow. extraordinarily mm. ge generative and extremely useful uh, uh, oh, for, for yeah. our current time. Um, may, maybe AI will be it's already going to erode what is true we, I mean, you already don't know what whether a video is is real or not we might get to the point where we can no longer trust anything uh that, that no. we're getting for news and we have to get back to personal relationships and and and, and get back maybe maybe, maybe that's a maybe that's an upside. it may paradoxically push us away from it if we can escape from it i know but you know trust is so fundamental and there's this famous chinese saying apparently of a third century emperor who said any civilization needs three things it needs guns food and trust if you have to get rid of them the first to go is guns if you have to get rid of something else it's food but if you lose trust you cannot survive and ai attacks trust we don't know what to believe about what our students have really understood where they've got their essays from what they really are doing in a court of law we don't know whether what looks like evidence is manufactured evidence or not you know it's really eroding trust between every, you know all of us but one good thing i just wanted to say in case people picked up on something i said earlier about engineering and the tendency towards a sort of rather left hemisphere mentality. One of the nicest things is how many people say, I realize that I used to be a very left hemisphere person. And they say things like, I am in fact an engineer. And then they say, but your book has completely revolutionized the way in which I think I see things differently. And their partners write to me and say, you know, and it's usually, she says, he is a different person. So if that's true, anything is good by my, <laughs> that's really just great to hear. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Todd, for, for generously saying those things. Mm. Well, your, your book is, I mean, it's, it's, it's it very accessible to, you know, somebody that, you know, like me in terms of the way I think and, and other people's, you know, books on spirituality and the sacred, it, they just feel like, you know hollow words to me you you've 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 established a very good portal uh you know, to to well, walk you. walk cool. people through the steps to understand Darn. limitations and to and to know when to actually like oh quit trying you know can't hold on to some can't hold on to things too tightly mm -hmm. you know or, or or you lose them um yeah. michael what what uh, last thoughts do you have maybe oh yeah i mean i was just having lots of 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 thoughts as he was talking about uh 
somehow quieting the the sort of left hemispheric approach or or you know because mm. the, the right hemisphere is there doing all this good stuff and if we just mm. if we just mm. you know have a little bit more um uncertainty or or something like that then then somehow the right hemisphere mm. will sort of reestablish itself no i don't think so, it's a surprise yes. that, that uh sam harris you know hyper hyper rational you know, sincere intelligent atheist is now yes. like in his second half of his career a mindfulness guru i mean i i don't think yes. i don't know if that's enough yes. you know uh, yes. i will i'll take yes. a walk in the woods over yes. Yes, or yes. sitting quietly uh, with my with my own thoughts anytime but, yeah. Yeah. yeah no i had a, i had a, a nice conversation with him uh, on his podcast um and we didn't necessarily agree about everything but i think that we, we had a good conversation so yeah all i can say is i hope and pray that that these things these questions will be asked that we will just be a little less certain about the things we think are so obvious and re-explore the richness of the things that we have that have been driven out of our lives so thank you both very much for yeah inviting me along and giving me a place to talk about these things and um yeah no this was fantastic yeah uh, honor thank on you. our part um, yeah. thank you for all the work that you do thank you for making the time for for folks like us um and uh it's we'll great. uh We'll, I'm we'll send you our URL when we when we have this, so that if you want to, yeah, yeah, if you want to post it yeah. after we've uh, after we've cleaned it up a little bit. Um, okay. Really appreciate your time today. Enjoy your evening. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.